Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study in this new format. Uh, we will be studying uh, the book of Philippians on Wednesday nights for a while. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. This is a, a change of plan for us on Wednesday night. One reason is the book of Philippians is uh, full of joy. It's been described as Paul's epistle of joy or letter of joy. And it's not a light, trivial joy. It's a joy that Paul expresses in the midst of his imprisonment. So as we are suffering, as we are uh, experiencing different kinds of hardship and upheaval in our lives, uh, we need to hear from somebody who can tell us how to be joyful and how to continue to serve the Lord in the midst of extremely trying and difficult circumstances. The other reason is, uh, on Sunday mornings, I've been preaching a series about hope in the face of death, even before all this um, got so crazy. And uh, this Sunday morning sermon is going to be from Philippians and Paul's passage about uh, how for him to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so studying the first part of Philippians this evening will help set us up for Sunday morning. Uh, and then the third reason is because I'm hoping that some folks who aren't normally with us on Wednesday night for our prayer meeting and Bible study will uh, take advantage of these videos and join us for this study of the book of Philippians. And so I want to start something new so that uh, if you're just joining us, you wouldn't feel like you're having to catch up or jumping in the middle of something, uh, but that you could start something new with us this evening. So if you're at home and you can take your Bible, uh, open to Philippians 1 uh, and uh, join us for this study of Paul's joyful prison epistle. Uh, let me read for us the first uh, several verses of Philippians 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now as we look this evening at Philippians 1, verses 1 to 18, there are several things that we see in this passage and that we uh, should be encouraged by in this passage from Paul's situation that apply to our situation. The first thing we know in Paul's opening um, of the letter as he gives thanks for the church is his thankfulness for gospel partners. In verse 3 he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Why? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now again, Paul uh, was in prison when he was writing this letter. He was writing it back to the church of Philippi, a place where he had visited, where he had been uh, even there in prison for a short time before uh, he was delivered after the earthquake and uh, 
the Philippian jailer and his whole household believed and were baptized. And Paul, as he writes back to this church at Philippi, uh, tells them that when he prays, uh, he gives thanks for them. He rejoices because of them, because they have been his partners in the gospel. Uh, later in the letter, he tells us that they have sent him a gift. They've sent him money to provide for him uh, while he's in prison and to enable him to continue to uh, share the gospel and, and take the gospel around the world. And so this is a church that is near and dear to his heart, a church that he loves, a church that uh, gives him joy. And, uh, and he expresses that uh, gratitude uh, to them in the, in the opening lines of this letter. And, and, I, and I just want to say right, right here, right at the beginning, um, that this is how I feel about our church. And I'm so grateful for our fellowship, our partnership in the gospel. And in this season with, where we can't meet together, uh, I believe that uh, that's going to grow our um, gratefulness, our thankfulness, our appreciation for the way God has blessed us as, as this um, as the privilege of meeting together is, is in a sense taken away for a while. Uh, you know what, what we all say, we don't really know what we have until it's gone. We don't know what we have until it's been taken away. Uh, I feel like this season is, uh, is going to be used by the Lord for us to recognize what a sweet privilege it is to be a part of a church family, to, to have the privilege of fellowship and, and sharing in the gospel and, and praying for one another and, and all those things. And when this is over, whenever that is, that uh, we will be even more eager to meet together, even more eager to gather together and to fellowship with one another. And so I, I just want you to know uh, how much I love you, love our church, and grateful for the ways the Lord has brought us together and knit our hearts together and joined us together in the gospel. And that's what gave Paul joy. Uh, even while he was in prison, even while he was suffering, he was rejoicing as he thought about these people he wasn't able to be with right now, but that he knew were standing side by side with him in the work of the gospel. And that's how I feel about you. I hope that's how you feel about our church. Then he says in verse 6, he says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He, he assures them and assures us of God's faithfulness to complete the work that he had begun in their lives. So right now, everything in our life just about feels like it's been disrupted, like it's been put on hold, like we don't know when the new, uh, when normal uh, is, when we're going to be, be able to return to normal. Um, but even in the midst of trying circumstances, even in the midst of all this uncertainty, there is one thing we can be sure of, and that is that God will continue to be at work in his people. He will continue to sanctify us, to make us more like Christ. He will continue to um, mature us and grow us. And uh, we can be confident that though many other things in our, our country and our culture right now have stopped working, uh, God has not stopped working. God remains faithful. God is continuing to work in us and through us and among us, and he will be faithful to complete what he started. So there are a lot of things that we don't know. We don't know if they're going to last through the next days, weeks, months, however long this takes. There are a lot of things we don't know um, about if, if they'll still be here on the other side. But we know that the Lord is faithful. We know that he will be with us. We know that he will continue to work in us and through us. And we can trust in him and trust in his promises even when everything else seems to be falling apart. Then uh, Paul goes on to say uh, in verse 9 what it is that he prays for the church at Philippi. He says, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So there are three things that Paul is praying for the church at Philippi here in this passage. First, he says he's praying that their love would abound. 
I'm just the chief mark of disciples, of people who belong to Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples that uh, they will know us by our love. And Paul prays that this church would abound in love. He prays uh, for them to have knowledge and discernment along with that love, that they would understand what is true and they would know how to uh, discern the difference between truth and error, what is wise and what is foolish. And then he says, uh, he prays that they would be, in verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. So Paul's praying for them to abound in love, to have knowledge and discernment, and to be fruitful. Now, um, not only in times like this, but often in our lives as Christians, we don't know what to pray. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that uh, when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So even when we take time to pray and feel like there's no words coming out, we don't know what to say, we know that even then the Spirit of God is praying on our behalf, which is incredibly comforting. But also it's true that when we don't know what to pray, there are prayers in the Bible that we can borrow in order to shape our own prayers. The Lord's Prayer, of course, is the chief uh, model for prayer that we're given in the Scripture. But Paul, uh, throughout his letters, uh, tells us the things that he is praying for the churches. And these are things that we can pray for ourselves, for our church, for uh, our friends and family and so on. And so I encourage you to take this prayer from uh, Philippians and make this your model, your pattern for prayer this evening, and maybe even through this week, uh, as you pray uh, for yourself and for your family and for your church. Um, pray that you and I and we as a body, that we would abound in love. That's the thing that we want to be focused on more than anything right now in this season. We don't want to be fearful. We don't want to panic. We don't want to be um, you know, afraid and, and dominated by fear. Uh, we want all of our responses to everything that's going on to be governed by love. Love for God and love for one another. We want to take care of one another. Uh, we want to we uh, care for those who are most vulnerable to uh, this sickness, and uh, that's why we are uh, not meeting, that's why we, many of us are having to stay at home. Uh, we're being asked to do these things, um, not merely uh, to protect ourselves, but to protect our neighbors, to protect our communities, to, to protect especially those uh, who have underlying health conditions or whatever who are, again, who are most vulnerable. And so think of your responses, think of your actions, think of the things you're not doing, um, not as something you're refusing to do out of fear because of your, you're afraid of what's going to happen to you, but that you're um, choosing not to do out of love because of the consequences that can result for other people. Uh, from what we're being told. So uh, we, we want to abound in love in this season and not be dominated by fear. We want our decisions to be governed by love. Uh, and, and that's a challenge, right? It's easy with all that we're hearing, all that we're being told, it's easy to become fearful and anxious and even overwhelmed. Um, but we want to pray that the Lord would help us to be filled with love. Um, and love doesn't always mean uh, going out and doing something. Right, right now, sometimes love means uh, staying home a lot, right? And, uh, and using the gifts of technology the Lord has given us to reach out to people. So glad we have cell phones and the internet and that we can text people and, and video chat and, and record sermons and, and distribute them. And all, all these things are ways that we can love each other uh, even while we're, many of us, stuck at home. So pray that the Lord would uh, cause us to abound in love. Pray that God would give us knowledge and discernment, that he would grow us in our understanding of the truth of God's word, in uh, discerning truth from error, uh, that he would help us to grow and mature uh, as Christians. Right? Th these are challenging days. We have challenging decisions before us, and uh, we need help. We need wisdom. We need discernment. We need to know what God expects of us, what God says to us, uh, and so we need to pray and ask God 
to help us and ask God to grant us wisdom, as, as uh, God says in James, or the Bible says in James 1 5, that God gives to all who ask for wisdom liberally, without finding fault. So ask Him for wisdom, ask Him to grow you in knowledge and discernment. And then uh, third, the third thing Paul prays for, ask that God would cause you, would cause our church to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. In other words, that we would be uh, fruitful, that we would do the things that are right and pleasing to God, the things that honor God and bring glory to God, as Paul says there at the end of verse 11. Pray that even in this season of, of pruning many things from our lives, uh, that we would continue to be fruitful. And that might look like uh, checking on your neighbors. Uh, that might look like checking on church members. That might look like, um, you know, picking up groceries for somebody. That might look like uh, spending uh, time in prayer uh, for our nation, for our leaders, uh, again, for your friends, for your family, for people you know who are sick. Um, be, ask the Lord to help you to be filled with the fruit of righteousness, doing the things that God wants us to do uh, even in this, in this season. So pray that you would abound in love. Pray that we would have knowledge and discernment. Pray that uh, we would be filled uh, with uh, good fruit, with good works. Right, and then uh, the next thing Paul says, and, and this I think is particularly helpful, for us in this in this situation. The next thing Paul says in verses 12 to 14 is that the gospel is advancing through Paul's imprisonment. All right, so I want you to, to get, try to get your mind around this. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He is the chief individual. And he's not the only person but he is the chief individual who is taking the gospel to the Gentiles. There are, are others who are preaching to Gentiles and seeking to spread the gospel, but nobody's doing it like Paul. Nobody's doing it as much as Paul, and nobody uh, has been called to it to the same degree that Paul has as the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, if you are longing for the gospel to spread throughout the world, and Paul is the chief instigator and leader of that spread of the gospel throughout the world, and he has been put in prison, confined to a particular place for an unknown amount of time. Just think how, uh, at first at least, how devastating that would seem to your hopes. How, how is the gospel going to spread if Paul's in prison. I mean, I know some of us can go here and there and tell this person and that person, but Paul's been traveling all over the empire, going from city to city, planting churches. Nobody seems to have the, the same gifts that he has, the same drive and motivation that he has. This seems like a massive blow to the advancement of the gospel. But that's not how Paul sees it. In verse 12, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, his imprisonment, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, how can Paul, being, being in prison, advance the gospel? Well, he gives us a couple of ways. Verse 13, he says, So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. In other words, all those who are in charge of watching over Paul and apparently all those in charge of the other prisoners, all the rest of the guard, all those who are involved in this imprisonment of Paul's, uh, guess what they're hearing about? They're hearing about Christ. He's telling them, the reason I'm in prison is because I believe the Savior that God promised to send the Jewish people, he has come, his name is Jesus, he died on the cross for sin, God raised him from the dead, and he's seated right now in heaven at God's right hand, and his message is that all people, not just the Jewish people, but Gentiles too, all people who turn to this Savior and trust in him, have their sins forgiven, have eternal life, will one day be raised from the dead to live in the presence of God in a new creation uh, where there's righteousness and peace and joy, the kind of world we all long to live in. And Paul's telling all these 
guards about this. He's telling all these soldiers about this. And the, and the message is spreading that Paul's imprisonment is for Christ, which means the message of Christ is spreading. So Paul being in prison has not stopped the gospel. It has merely caused the gospel to advance in a different way among a different group of people. And then he says in verse 14, there's another way the gospel is advancing through Paul's imprisonment. He said, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So there are other Christians, in other words, who had been timid about sharing the gospel, but now that Paul is in prison, they have become more bold in sharing the gospel. Now, why would that be? We would think if your leader gets put in prison, uh, then you would be less likely to share the gospel. If he's in prison for the gospel, then aren't people going to be afraid to share the gospel? lest they end up in prison like Paul? Well, there probably were some folks who responded that way. But what Paul is is seeing and what he wants to highlight is that exactly the opposite has happened for a lot of people, that when they see Paul willing to suffer for the gospel and now put in prison for the gospel, they're ready to take up that mantle. If Paul was willing to sacrifice in that way, if Paul was willing to to suffer in order to bring the gospel to me, and now he's been imprisoned and he can't bring the gospel to as many people, then I'm going to take up the charge. I'm going to start sharing the gospel. I'm going to uh, imitate Paul in his fearlessness and his boldness in sharing the good news about Christ. And so more people were actually sharing the gospel. So this is what we're dealing with in a certain way, right? So many people, so many churches have had to uh, withdraw in a sense. We've had to close our doors temporarily. Many of us have to stay at home. Churches are not able to meet. Isn't this going to uh, hurt the cause of the gospel? Isn't this going to uh, cause uh, the gospel to, to not be able to advance like it was before? No. No, in fact, if we look at this situation with the eyes of Paul, we might see some ways that the gospel can actually advance through this season of quarantine and lockdown and all the rest that perhaps it wasn't advancing before. Maybe people who don't normally go to church, maybe people who don't normally read the Bible, maybe people who don't normally think about Jesus in the midst of all this craziness will start listening to sermons online, start um, reading the Bible for themselves, start asking questions of their Christian friends. Um, Maybe people will start having gospel conversations that they've been putting off with people now that they uh, realize through these circumstances things are a lot more uh, sober, there's a lot fewer distractions, there's a lot more awareness of the things that really matter and Uh, how brief our lives can be and how easily they can be disrupted and even brought to an end, uh, that maybe God will use this season to actually spread the gospel even more, that more people will be willing to listen, that more people will will be seeking out uh, the truth and and seeking out uh, what God says and and what God wants them to do and and, uh, what God has done for them. Maybe... Uh, God is going to use this season for the gospel uh, to advance. And that doesn't mean that we think this situation is great. I mean, Paul didn't want to be in prison, obviously. We don't want there to be uh, a quarantine or a lockdown or or all this disruption. We, We want to be able to gather together. We want to be able to meet together. We're missing something by having to do it this way. It's better than not being able to do anything at all, but this this is not ideal by any means, just as it was not ideal for Paul to be in prison. But that does not mean that we should lose hope. That does not mean that we should uh, be afraid that the gospel is going to be hindered or limited. Uh, We can still rejoice. We can still have joy, and the gospel can still advance. One more brief Uh, section of this letter before we close tonight. Verses 15 to 18, uh, Paul acknowledges that of those people who are preaching the gospel while he's in prison, 
Not all of them are doing it for the right reasons. Right? Verse 15 says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So you've got some people who realize, okay, Paul's in prison. He's limited in the number of people he can share the gospel with. So we ought to take up the slack. We ought to uh, do our part to spread the gospel while Paul can't because we love God, because we love Paul, because we love our neighbors. We're going to continue this labor. We're going to continue sharing the gospel. But there were others who were preaching the gospel at this time from sinful, uh, selfish motives. 